Join us on a journey toward a freer world through sound economic policy and a love for individual freedom. Welcome to Free the World. Welcome everyone to the latest episode of Free the World, a show from Students for Liberty where we explore the ideas that set us free. And I'm here today to talk about a question that I think many people in our audience are very curious about, and it centers around teachers unions. Uh, the real question that we wanted to discuss today was how do teachers unions get away with so much? Um, public sector unions broadly are, are, are kind of a difficult situation. Uh, they have a lot of political weight on their side in bargaining situations, and you often end up in a situation where uh, you find the government's bargaining with itself using taxpayer dollars and predictably ending up with more spending and more um, outcomes that benefit the state. So today we wanted to center specifically around teachers unions and talk about how they become have become in our society so powerful and influential. So to that end, I want to bring in our guest, Keith Williams. Um, Keith is the Senior Vice President for the Center for Independent Employees, which is a 501c3 legal defense foundation that provides free legal representation and aid to independent employees who are opposed to union oppression in their workplace. So let's bring Keith on. Good morning, Keith. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. What about yourself? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. It's yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for making time for us. And thanks for all the work you do to fight for workers' rights. We're really excited to learn a little bit more about the work you guys are doing um, in your organization. I, I wanted, if it's okay with you, Keith, just to kick us off with a really broad question, um, uh, specifically around the Center for Independent Employees. So uh, before we get into any of the nuance around teachers unions and all these other kind of fights you found yourself at the center of, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about your organization and your role? Sure. Well, uh, essentially, the Center for Independent Employees is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that is formed essentially to come in and assist employees who no longer see that they uh, they have a useful union in their workplace. So they may have unionized at one point and realized that, hey, maybe you know this isn't what I signed up for. And while there are tons of resources to help uh, employees unionize, as you're well aware, if anybody picks up a newspaper at this point, it, there's usually something on the front page about UAW or the Teamsters or something like that. Uh, there are very few resources, really no resources to help those employees remove a union once it's in. Uh, so there's you know only a, a very short list of organizations out there that do that. And I would say an even shorter list, really um, us, Center for Independent Employees, who can help facilitate a campaign on behalf of employees to remove a union from their workplace. So that's gotcha. essentially what we do. Gotcha, okay. All right, so interesting work. Before we get into some of the nuance that you've done around teachers unions, I just kind of wanted to start with you about a broad question for you and your perspective on unions broadly. I mean, how do you how do you approach that situation? And then we can maybe talk a little bit about the details between pr public and private sector, but just kind of big picture question. Um, how do you feel like the roles of union, like what, what has it been the impacts of the roles of unions in general and how do you kind of uh, handle that question? Yeah, I think the, uh, in terms of handling it, I think it's important to differentiate first of all between public and private sector. Um, and then within the private sector, you know, remember you also have a big difference between your SEIUs and, and those types of, uh, those types of unions and then your trade unions. So when we're talking about unions, you know, I think the, the romantic model, we'll say, is typically that of the trade unions. Um, and of course, when we're talking public sector, you know, the conversation completely changes and, and public sector unions really weren't a thing until the late 60s and early 70s. So um, in terms of labor law, uh, when we're talking about private sector unions, that is governed by really by federal law. Uh, when you're talking public sector, public sector unions, because they came in much later, uh, those are generally governed by state laws. So when we talk about teachers unions, uh, teachers unions are governed by state law um, and state statute, whereas uh, a private sector union in, in say, um, a hospital or, you know, we're hearing a lot about Starbucks and Trader Joe's and all those unionizations. Those are all governed by the National Labor Relations Act, which is a, a federal federal law. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, practically speaking, I think it's important to to keep in mind that a union is a is a third party. They are a they are a business, right? They're in business to provide some sort of real or perceived value. Um, and so, in an ideal world, they would be held accountable to their customers to produce some sort of value for them, right? Um, but what we see a lot of times is once they're in the law really makes it difficult to get them out. And so there's very little accountability uh, to the membership when it comes to, it's kind of a one-way street. They get in and then then it's hard to get them out. And they don't really have to serve the members because it is difficult to exercise your rights to get them out or to remove yourself from that union once it's in your workplace. Noted. Okay. So obviously we want to center around teachers unions, that type of you know public sector union. Um, why don't we just start then big picture around misconceptions? Like what, you know, from your experience and the conversations you've had, what do you feel like some of the biggest misconceptions are about teachers unions and their role in kind of improving educational outcomes and things like that? Yeah, well, again, it's important to keep in mind the role of a union, right? The, the role of a union really is to provide benefit for its members. So when unions begin to, particularly teachers unions begin to talk about, uh, you know, it's for the students. Well, I mean, we all know it's not for the, like the union is not there for the students. Maybe the members are employed in that school for the students, but the union itself, again, be mindful that it is a, it is a business in and of itself. That business does not care about students. That business cares about its dues paying members and ensuring that they continue to pay dues. Um, so then more broadly, why do teachers join a union? And I think that's where you get into uh, some of the, the psychology behind this. And I'll say this is, this is generally where those on our side struggle because we want to think logically. We want to think very logically and analytically. This is an emotional decision uh, oftentimes, right? The union comes in and they promise uh, respect in the workplace, right? Well, how can, how can you bargain respect? How can you negotiate respect? Um, and so that's why very, very often, um, in fact, most times, when unionization occurs, it's not because of pay. Uh, there's usually some poor, poor management, uh, maybe some some favoritism or inconsistent treatment. Um, you know, issues that have gone unaddressed for a long time, uh, and it really tends to be a nuclear option for a lot of people. Um, in the case of a teachers' union, like right now, I live in Pennsylvania. There are no teachers working right now, except maybe in charter schools that may have recently unionized. Um, none of our 500 school districts has any teachers in them uh, where those teachers actually voted in the union. So it is basically a status quo mentality. You get a job in a school district, the union is there. They are your exclusive representative. You don't get to go and negotiate uh, your salary, your wages, hours, working conditions, you you don't have the ability to go and negotiate because the union is there as the bargaining representative. They have the exclusive rights to go in and bargain on your behalf. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the current environment we're in right now. Okay. So how does that affect outcomes? That's kind of my, my, you know, that's where I think I'm curious. So obviously there's all these employee rights conversations and whatnot that go into mm -hmm. that, but you know, what do you feel like that role is and how, how that kind of dynamic has actually led to, has it, has it, has it impacted the outcomes of, of education broadly? Um, you know, again, I think how it's impacted the outcome might be, um, you know, if we're looking at employment issues and um, what unions on the ground, when I want to say on the ground, I mean, at the local level have, uh, have really negotiated, um, you know, things that we often talk about, like tenure, um, I think tenure sometimes when we negotiate tenure, that is viewed as some sort of impenetrable force field that prevents all teachers from ever being removed ever. Um, and that just simply isn't the case. I mean, really, if, if you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's uh, and doing your due diligence, you can still remove a bad employee. Um, but it is the union's job, right? Legally, they have to uh, or should be putting up a fight for their for the employees that they represent. So I think it's important to understand, too, that 
you know, I think sometimes we get frustrated when we look at a, a union who is, well, they're, you know, they're protecting bad teachers. Well, that's literally their job as a union is to protect the members and they could be liable if they don't. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, when we talk about outcomes, I think it's important to remember, again, the union doesn't work for the students. The union works for the teachers and the dues paying members. Um, and because the union is working for the members of the bargaining unit, and again, the bargaining unit may not be the members. You could have a hundred teachers in a bargaining unit. 80 of them could be members. 20 of them could be non-members of the union. Uh, the union still has exclusive representation of all of those, all of those, uh, those teachers in this case. Um, but it is their legal responsibility to defend them in cases of an employment issue. Sure. So, so you're, you, I, I gather again, you were saying that it could create an incentive where you've got, uh, you know, with, you know, with a, with a public sector union where you've effectively got the taxpayers lobbying against their own interests. Um, sure. In some sure. cases, like to remove well, that feature. Yeah, when we're, when we're talking, yeah, when we're talking about uh, taxpayers lobbying against their own interests, I think that's when you get into, um, you know, I think the fundamental issues, the ideological uh, problems, moral hazards with having public sector unions in general. Right, sure. it, a, a private sector union can negotiate itself out of existence, as we saw with, you know, yellow uh, freight. They they went out of business. Um, you see that a lot of times with private sector unions where they'll just simply ask too much. The business folds and they lose their members. They lose those dues paying members. Sure. There are no checks and balances in the public sector. So if if I ask for more and in, in the case of my own school district right now, we're asking the the, the board majority just proposed a seven point two percent increase in taxes. Now, if the union is asking too much in the public sector, um, I'm not saying that's why they're, that's not necessarily in this case, why they're asking. There's, there's been a lot of just financial mismanagement there, um, keeping up with the Joneses. But in this case, if the union says, Hey, look, we want, we need a raise. We haven't gotten a raise. Um, then they can just raise taxes in this case. Right. So sure. if I, as a union begin to grease the palms of local politicians and state level politicians and eventually it becomes this self-serving cycle um, where you as a union bring in the people who are going to just advance your interests um, so that's you know the like i said that's the the ultimate underlying issue with public sector that you don't you don't necessarily have with uh, private sector unions. Noted. That makes sense. So, okay. So then let's get back to a little bit of what you guys are doing at the Center for Independent Employees. Uh, you know, what kind of work do you guys do to like correct some of the misunderstandings uh, around kind of uh, around these specific types of unions? Um, yeah. And then I want to talk a little bit more about some of the wins that you guys have seen and things like that. Uh, the, so the, the real issue, I think when you get into teachers unions in particular is, um, you have you have to realize that a, a teacher has a transient leadership, right? There, the the school board changes, the administrations come and go. Um, you have state and federal policies and agendas that come and go. So teachers are really looking for some sort of stability in leadership, and oftentimes they find that in the perceived stability of a union. Um, and so even for, you know, I'll say a, a centrist uh, or even center left, center right, kind of a, a middle of the road educator, which um, I think it's easy to forget that a lot of educators really are. Uh, they're not all the crazy, you know, leftist libs of TikTok uh, <laughs> teachers that everybody seems to think they are these days. Um, there was a there was actually a study done by. Um, Jay Green and James Paul from the Heritage Foundation uh, a few years back, they found that, you know, teachers tend to be, they do tend to skew a little bit left, but they are not at all uh, represented by the, the crazy ideological views that you're seeing out there today that are, you know, we, we want to think that's, you know, what's going on in the classroom? Oh my gosh, it's all these horrible things, right? It's this sort of, this outrage, uh, 
outrage agenda that's out there. And it's in most cases, it's not, not that at all. But what happens is you end up with a scenario where teachers feel, and again, emotion, right? So I'm going to come back to emotion, right? We're, we're thinking logic. This is an emotional thing. If I, if I'm looking around at, at the environment out there right now as a teacher, and I'm a, you know, in my case, I'll say I'm a, I'm a center right teacher and I'm looking at the, at the news or in the, in the media, right? Public schools are failing. Teachers are Marxist. These are government, government school indoctrination centers, right? We got to remove tenure, te like public schools are a burden on the taxpayer. I want to teach my kids and do my job. I, I love working with kids. That's what got me into this. I want to, by the way, put food on the table at the end of the day because I have a family of my own. So it puts me in an awkward situation. OK, who do I who do I align myself with? Do I align myself with my ideological, um, you know, political allies over here who are basically threatening my existence and telling me I'm doing a horrible job? Or do I align myself with this this devil I know over here who, even though I know they're abusive and they're not at all representative of my of my political views, they are at least promising protection. Again, whether real or perceived, we can get into that. But um, that's really the decision that a lot of teachers are faced with. And so it's not simply, I don't agree with their political views, therefore I'm gonna pull my dues out. It's a very, um, there's a there's a very um, tangible uh, decision to be made. They're, they're looking at, at both sides going, which one is gonna ensure that I'm able to continue to feed my family and, and have a retirement income when this is all said and done. Sure. Okay. It, it makes sense. Um, makes sense. So, well then why don't we, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, this decision in, in Pennsylvania um, and kind of how that ties back to some of the things we've been discussing. So as you mentioned, I know you, you're an educator, you've spent doing this for 20 years. I think you'd also on your bio it's indicated that you've been a coach and you've, you've worked in this space. Um, there was a, a Supreme court decision where in Pennsylvania, where they, they overturned union fair share fees. And I, it, maybe I'm miss. Yeah. Tell me if I'm mischaracterizing that at all. Um, but I, I'm curious as to what is a union fair share fee? Cause I actually never heard of this until I started researching your background a little bit okay. and kind of why, how do they impact, impact outcome? So, yeah. So the, the Supreme court decision you're referencing, that was, uh, the Janus versus AFSCME decision yes. that was, uh, back in June of 2018 when that decision came down okay. and that was preceded by a similar case, uh, Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. Um, that case was deadlocked when Scalia passed away so that the court was deadlocked for four. Um, so they never got a decision. Mark Janice's case then came up through the ranks and uh, we now have the Janice versus AFSCME decision. But underlying all of this was a, was a challenge to a practice of charging what's called agency fees. Now, if you understand what right to work means in the private sector, that's essentially what we're talking about in the public sector. So the, the employee's right to not be forced uh, to pay a fee to this, this union, right? If I don't want to be a member, I shouldn't have to pay, uh, to have this, to have this thing representing me. Right. And the union will say, well, we're charging you the cost of representing you, right? This is, this is our cost of representing you. And the non-member says, well, I didn't ask you to represent me in the first place. I would rather represent myself, but unions want exclusive representation. They want to have the right, the ability to pull all the other chairs away from the negotiating table and say, we are the exclusive rep. So that's the trade-off that they unions are willing to make is we want to be the exclusive rep, even if that means we can't charge, we can't force everybody to, to pay full union dues. So this case back in 2018, essentially what happened, Mark Janis was a, a, um, a uh, gosh, what a support, a child care support specialist. Um, so he, his job was to, in the cases of uh, shared custody, he had to he had to calculate what an appropriate amount of child support was. So he was basically an accountant for the state, and asked me, says, "Hey, you owe us money as a non-union member. You owe us eighty percent of full union dues." 
and he looks at what AFSCME is advocating for in the state of Illinois, and he says, are you kidding me? You're bankrupting Illinois. I don't support your agenda. I don't support what you are representing of me. Like you're saying you represent me. You don't represent me. This isn't what I agree with. And so his case found its way up through the courts. And essentially what happened at the end was the court said, look, because this is a public sector union bargaining with the taxpayer, right? That it's the union sitting across the table from the taxpayer. Because of that relationship in the public sector, all public sector union money is inherently political. Simply because you're sitting across the table, not from a private business owner, but from the taxpayer. And therefore it's it's all political money. And you can't compel someone to subsidize political speech. And that's what that case essentially uh, did away with was this practice of saying, hey, as a non-union member, you still have to pay us 80% of full union dues. We, so, yeah. So what is the what is the result of that? I mean, I guess that's that's a lot more freedom for employees, right? I mean, sure. um, what, do you know after that decision was made, what kind of uh, whether there were any outcomes that improved, you know, made a positive impact? Because uh, that's yeah, a yeah, well, great it, reform. It, it, uh, it essentially allowed, you know, and it was an incentive to join the union is really what it came down to, right? Sure. If, I, if I'm a non-union member, if I'm a non-union teacher in a school district and that local school district is forcing me to pay agency fees or fair share fees to the tune of 80%, yeah. but I'm still not a member and I still can't go to the meetings and I still can't have the sheet cake at the end of the year and the, and the pizza party, yeah. right? There's You're ostracized a lot of times. Um, and again, that dynamic is different from, from bargaining unit to bargaining unit, school district to school district. Um, some of them are more petty than others, sure. but if you're a non-member, you're not, you're not entitled to the same rights and privileges as a member when it comes to, uh, negotiations, your awareness of what's being negotiated. Uh, so you're, you're in the dark, but you're paying 80% of full dues. And so there was an incentive to just pay the extra 20% and go along just so that you're, you're a part of it because I have to pay 80% anyway. So it was a, it was really an incentive to, to become a union member. Um, and what we saw after the Janus decision was an incremental drop off in union membership. And if you look at a, if you look at a state, um, states where they've gone from, um, non right to work to right to work. So Michigan, which, has, by the way, just flipped back again to right to work. But in the private sector, you see that drop to about 80%, um, 75 to 80%. So they've done the calculations and they realize, okay, if if this, if this fair share fee thing goes away, if agency fees go away, if right to work comes in, we're going to lose, you know, ballpark 25 to 20, 20 to 25% of our membership. Um, and that's pretty consistent with what we've seen. Um, but again, those people who leave and it, it, it's a way for the individual to hold the union accountable. Sure. But it's also a way for the individual to hold the union accountable. And that's where I think, you know, in the libertarian center right space, we get we get hung up on acting into acting as an individual and not thinking about the, the collective side of it. And that's where, you know, we're looking at this at the Center for Independent Employees going, OK, these are all one offs. This is great. You're getting, you know, people have the right to leave. We've we've advanced liberty. We've advanced your freedom of association. But the underlying issue is those people are still forced to be represented by this this union that they may or may not agree with. So exclusive representation is still an issue. Yeah. Um, and that that continues even if the individual leaves the union and is no longer paying dues. They don't get to negotiate. I see. I see another, I assume that's, yeah, another fight that's going to be had in the future. Um, so, right. okay, well, well I want to talk about another, another win that you guys had, um, related to ghost teaching. So I know that you guys sued, uh, sued a union. We ended the, you ended the ghost teaching practices and, um, I, I've never heard of a ghost teacher until a couple of <laughs> years ago. It sounds a little creepy. <laughs> what yeah. is a ghost teacher, Keith? So that's that was an interesting uh, an interesting case uh, here in Pennsylvania, and and essentially the union settled, so there was no you know they 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 avoid a they avoid a ruling so that there is nothing to to do away with the practice entirely. That's that's a common practice. It's this attack and retreat kind of a thing, and they're they're just 
they'll get away with it as long as they can. And then when somebody calls them on it, they'll just settle out and make it go away. Um, and in this particular case, uh, there was a, a uh, district over in Eastern Pennsylvania, larger school district, where the union president, who was also on payroll as a full-time teacher, was doing full-time union work. And that's what they call release time. Um, so we could call this a, a release time issue is really what it was. And so this, this uh, full-time union president is doing full-time union work, but on the payroll of the school district as a teacher. Okay, now in this particular case, the union, and in a lot of cases, if you read the contract, the union will agree to reimburse the district for the cost of this release time. Okay, but the other issue is rarely do we see anybody think this through and go, well, wait a second, they're accruing pension credit. And so in this case, even though the district was reimbursing for the release time, they were still this this union president was still accruing pension credit, which is paid for by yep. guess who? Right. Yep. The, the, the taxpayer. taxpayer. <laughs> um, so we basically because I'm a vested member of the pension system, uh, you know, I had I had uh, fair game here um, and got involved in that. And they ended up like I said, they ended up. Uh, settling out of that and and ending that practice but you still see it um you know it pops up here and there so it's something that we need to to be aware of and and recognize it as an issue um because again they'll get away with it if if and where they can how do you do you know how the practice started like where did this come from so i mean obviously the idea here is in theory they're not costing money but obviously you look at pensions and there's a huge amount of cost in the long term did, is this like a nationwide phenomenon? I mean, like, where did this? Well, start? you see it in the private sector where, um, you know, a, a uh, in a large shop, right? So it's a, a union's job to uh, deal with grievances, right? To, to go through the grievance process. If an employee has an issue, um, your local union leadership is responsible for working through that grievance process and doing the investigations, doing the due diligence. Um, so that employee who is, by the way, also a an elected member of the local union has to have some time to deal with employee issues on the spot in places where there is a union representative present, right? So if there is a practical rationale in in the private sector and again it's it's all negotiated this is all stuff that's that's negotiated by the board by the school board in this case um and i think that too speaks to the importance of a school board is you know a lot of school boards just they just give things away they're seemingly benign but they're you know obviously there's a cost there right if you've got an employee who's on the payroll but they're running around doing other things yeah um there's, there is a cost. So makes sense. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about what happened in what was, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, so I think one of the biggest national stories is, you know, governor Scott Walker kind of making a name for himself going against the unions in Wisconsin over a decade ago. Um, you know, I am curious a little bit about, you know, what contributed to his success. I know that that was a, you know, a, a, that was a unique situation. Um, but I am curious as to like what factors you feel like maybe played a role in that. Um, and, and whether this battle against unions is just going to be something that we are dealing with for eternity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, that I would say that was a, a, a perfect storm. Can I, can I, is that the right sure. yeah. phrase there maybe? Um, you know, that was kind of a perfect storm scenario. I, I like to, rather than look at examples like that, you know, because again, Wisconsin, their, their Supreme Court just flipped. Okay. And so now, just like in Michigan, where we had right to, you know, we got rid of, we got rid of right to work or, well, they got rid of right to work, right to work went back, was, was voted in. Now right to work is gone again, right? You've got this, this push and pull of the union agenda because they're entwined now with, uh, politicians and they, you know, they receive 99% of union money goes to democratic candidates. 
Um, and and the, I would argue the Republican candidates that it goes to, you know, the, the idea there is they'll run a Republican until they can buy a Democrat. Um, so, you know, their strategy is clear. And to your point, yes, we will be playing whack-a-mole until we really figure out what some of the underlying issues are. And, um, you know, that's where I look at a state like Iowa yep. or, you know, if you're familiar with some of the recent legislation that's happened in Florida, uh, Senate Bill 256 in Florida requires 60 percent uh, proof of membership every year. So if you're a school district, uh, I think there's 67 counties in Florida. If you're a, a school district in Florida and you have a you're you're the union in that local in that county district you have to provide proof of proof that 60 percent of the teachers or support staff or however your your bargaining units are parsed up you have to provide proof that you have 60 percent membership every year if you fall below that threshold then you have to stand for re-election so now here's what happens and this is where from a from a teacher, I have to I have to take my policy hat off and put my teacher hat on and go, guys, this is this is why this isn't working. OK, when that when that happens, when you trigger that election. OK, and the same is true in Iowa. They, they have to stand for recertification as well. It's a little different in Iowa, but they still periodically have to stand for reelection. You are giving these in this case, these teachers a decision of something or nothing. And I go back to the messaging that we have had for the last 20, 30 years of how we view public schools and public teachers. And if I am a teacher who has to make a decision between something and nothing, then I'm going to choose something. Sure. Because the idea of having no representation, the idea of just trusting what a lot of times is a crazy school board who is fired up by the base and they show up and they run for election and they've got their you know torches and pitchforks and they're ready to go they're going to like tear this district up and we're going to make some changes that scares teachers right that's my career i've been working here for 25 years and you know you, you have some very real concerns about somebody who is uh fired up to get in there and blow it blow up the system sure um so when they stand for re-election what typically you'll see is actually a bump in union membership sometimes because the union will say look if you don't join us you're going to lose everything and so again it's this fear sell now we can argue about you know we can, we can go back and forth about whether the whether that fear is valid or not um but it's a very real argument that they're making is you're going to lose you're going to lose our representation. You're going to be on your own and you don't have time. You don't have time to do the laundry, let alone have time to negotiate for yourself. Right. I have 96 research papers sitting on my desk and 45 kids that are going to be seeing me after after school for cross country practice. When do I have time to go, you know, learn the finer points of negotiation and, and advocate for myself and no employment law and all this kind of stuff. So it really freaks teachers out. And sometimes you'll see union membership actually creep up. Um, now, the thinking with with this legislation was that they were going to just simply it was going to be a mechanism to remove unions. If you understand why teachers are in the union in the first place, then you understand that you're going to take, particularly in a state like Florida, where you've got right to work and you have a lot of people that are just sitting on the bench watching this all go down. There's a lot of apathy there. People who are in the union or people who are considering it, they're the ones who it affects the most. So if you've got 50% union membership, you fall below the 60% threshold. Um, and now you're threatened with recertification and losing the whole, the whole thing. It's pretty easy to convince 10% of those people, Hey, look, we're going to be without nothing. We're going to be left in the cold and you're going to have to trust the school board, um, you know, with your wages, hours, working conditions and advocating for you. Um, and they're just not willing to do that a lot of times. So um, that's where we've really had the success. And uh, one of the things that 
I've been a big advocate for for years. I would even before I got into the policy space while I was still in the classroom was this concept of the independent local union. And so rather than make this binary decision of union or no union, throw a third option out there and say, hey, look, we understand you got a crazy school board. You have, you know, an administrator who has it out for you and they want to put their their thumb on you. Um, you have some very real concerns. So rather than hitch your wag into this state and national corporate big labor model, which I like to I like to refer to it as corporate big labor because they're so anti-corporate, but NEA itself is a $1.6 billion lobbying group, right? Oh, yeah. So rather than hitch your wag into corporate big labor, create this independent thing that is standalone. So set you up with your own constitution and bylaws, you elect your own president, vice president, secretary, treasurer um get your own attorney on retainer right but all those things are very that's intimidating for a teacher right and no teacher comes no i was a high school english teacher i did not know labor law at the time sure. i did not have any clue what i was doing right so even though i had an opportunity to do this trying to get people to buy into it on the center right and say hey look we're going to create a union right they're like mind blown like no 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 no. we're not creating unions that's not what we do and i said sure. no, no no time out it's not corporate big labor it's it's separate it's the buy local movement of labor and your money doesn't go to the state and national stuff it stays local your discretion stays local your politics stay local it's more representative of your community right you don't have the 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 thumb of big labor pushing down on you with all of their craziness um so that's really the model that we have tried to uh, tried to advance in schools in particular. Sure. Um, because teachers, like I said, teachers have a lot coming at them from a lot of different sides. And it's just a it's a good, happy medium that a lot of districts have been have been very pleased with. We've done it 40, about 40 times in seven states at this point. So, wow. Now, yeah. Nice. OK, well, you know, so that's a good pivot then to, to look forward a little bit. Um, you know, wh where are you focused, Keith, right now in in the, in the go forward plan with your organization? I mean, are there any fights that you're looking for? Are there any I mean, other than some of the stuff we touched on earlier, um, anything to maybe bring us to close us out that you think we sh our audience should be aware of or look into? Yeah, well, I mean, as far as our you know, we work in the private sector as well. So we do have some some active cases in the private sector. But um in the public space again for myself as a teacher you know i was a teacher for over 20 years um in a public high school uh english and i was cross country and track coach for years so i'm very passionate about uh about teachers and education and and just supporting educators and so um anybody who knows me in the policy space knows that like you better be real careful how you refer to public school teachers uh, when you start going down that road, because it is a it is a union strategy to conflate uh, the union with the teachers. And those are those are not the same. So public school teachers and teachers unions, again, their goal is to conflate the two. Yep. Don't play into that game. Right. So um, I've really been, you know, my goal for this year is really to to get hopefully get about 20 more of these independent locals started uh, in school districts across the state. Well, obviously, um, districts where there is collective bargaining, right? Because not every state has not every state we're talking about collective bargaining. But in the states where we do have collective bargaining, I'll say the Rust Belt states in particular, um, even California. I've been speaking to some teachers in California about uh, this independent local model. Uh, that's really been my focus uh, these last last well, really last five years has been um, helping teachers with this this kind of a paradigm shift in uh, representation. Noted. OK, very interesting. So if our audience wants to go and learn more about your mission um, back you guys up, where do they look? Well, you can go to our ridiculously long URL center for independent employees dot org. And uh, if you're like me, you'll have to recheck the spelling of independent three or four times before you hit the return button. Um, or you can uh, you can shoot me an email, Keith at Center for Independent Employees dot org. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn and shoot me a private message. And uh, that works, too. So 
Awesome. Either either of those works, any of those works, but um, we're out here and we're eager eager to help. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for the work that you're doing to fight for liberty in people's workplace. I mean, that's a very important mission. And uh, personally, I've I think a lot of people in our audience understand the the dangers and the hazards of public sector unions. So I learned a lot um, and I appreciate you making time. For it. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. We'll have you back soon. All right. Sounds great. See you, brother. So for, for the rest of our audience, um, if you're interested in learning more about Students for Liberty, you can check our website out at studentsforliberty.org. We obviously have the local coordinator program, which is SFL's premier program for liberty-minded students who be want to become the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, we'll give you the resources that you need to make a difference. We'll invest in your personal development, and we'll let you join an elite network of leaders on every inhabited continent. If you want to learn more about the local coordinator program, you can go to join.studentsforliberty.org. We would love to have you. You can submit an application based on your region at the bottom of the page. Uh, but we'll be back again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and uh, peace out.